Good morning and welcome to today's webinar covering the SRA's approach to customer due diligence. This morning, I'm delighted to be joined by Amy Bell, Director at Teal Compliance. Amy will be sharing her insights into the challenges currently facing firms, how to remain compliant and the value of, of a solid AML solution. Louise Edwards, Product Manager at InfoTrack is also joining us to provide a quick overview of the AML offering through InfoTrack. So before we begin the webinar, I would like to draw your attention to the Q&A tab, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We will be running a Q&A at the end of this session. So please type any questions you might have along with your name into the Q&A box. That way, if we run out of time or your question requires further explanation, what we can do is we can extract your information and follow up with you after the webinar. That's all from me for now. I will now hand you over to Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy, um, and hello to everybody. If you've not met me before, my name's Amy Bell. I'm director of a business called Teal Compliance, and we help law firms with all the rules and the regulations that they need to follow. Um, I, I think, I suppose I'm a specialist in anti-money laundering. I've worked in the area since 2005. Um, I've been a member of the Law Society's Money Laundering Task Force since 2010. Um, and I was their chair whilst we were looking at the implementation of the 2017 money laundering regulations. Um, so anti-money laundering is, you know, my, my passion. Um, and today what I wanted to talk to you about was so a recent report put out by um, the Solicitor's Regulation Authority um, and share with you both what they think about how firms tackle their CDD and also what we see at Teal when we're out and about helping firms with their policies or auditing or generally kicking the tyres of their AML processes. There are some common things that firms do struggle to either um, get in place, working well, or even if it's working well, they do struggle to demonstrate it to the regulator. So hopefully as a result of today's session, you will have some practical tips, places to look, things to think about to make sure that if you um, are approached by the regulator, um, that you are in a good place to be able to demonstrate that you've got effective CDD in place. Um, if you've never met me before, though, I will just give you a caveat to that. Um, generally, it's not my practice to encourage people to do things because we're scared of regulators. That's not really why we should do anti-money laundering. I'm sure nobody on the call uh, thinks that that's their biggest priority. Stopping money laundering is really the point of client due diligence. Um, and so we'll talk a bit about that as well, because, you know, one of the things that we do need to think about when we're building an AML system is um, firstly, is it going to be effective at preventing money laundering? Secondly, does it demonstrate compliance with the regulations? They're not necessarily the same thing. Um, so we'll get into it. Um, I'm, I'm going to direct you to a piece of uh, work that the, the SRA have uh, published. Now, the, the link there is on the slide. Um, if you go onto um, their uh, website and um, ask for um, anti money, look for in the search bar anti money laundering um, AML visits 2019, hopefully you will come across it, but that's the link if you need it. Um, and this is a report where they uh, published their, um, the, um, uh, findings of uh, work that they have done. Um, and uh, in 2019, 2020, they have just put out another piece of work, which I'm not proposing to talk about at the moment. It's quite high level um, in relation to the SRA's almost um, information for the sector about where AML work in general. This uh, piece of work, though, that I've referenced here goes much more into the detail and the nitty gritty of what they are uh, seeing out in practice and what they're concerned about. Now, this, pa this paper focuses on visits of um, 74 uh, firms. And um, so not loads of firms. Um, if you think about the population that the SRA regulate, and they regulate about um, six and a half thousand firms. So, you know, that's why I'm saying you know, the chances of the regulator knocking on the door are still quite slim because they're only seeing a really small percentage of the population in any given year. Um, whereas if you were perhaps tuning in from Scotland, um, the Law Society of Scotland try and visit their firms once every three years. 
So um, in England and Wales, we don't necessarily have that same um, contact with the regulator that you might have with some of the smaller regulators, um, but it is a possibility that they will come and see you. If I was talking to you about five years ago, there'd be next to no chance of them coming to see you, if I'm honest. Um, but uh, they have in the last uh, five years really increase their focus on this. They've um, established a team specifically for uh, looking at AML compliance. Um, and um, so it, it is possible. A lot of firms ask me, you know, how, how can I tell if I'm on the hit list? <laughs> what, how, what's the likelihood of me being visited? Now, um, given um, uh, that I'm doing this session today for InfoTrack, um, I think you will all be aware that conveyancing is pretty high up on the, um, on the risk radar of the regulator. Um, we know this is covered in the national risk assessment that um, property work specifically conveyancing, but also commercial property is high risk for money laundering. Now, when I talk about high risk for money laundering, I'm not saying that it means that all conveyancing transactions are uh, susceptible to money laundering. What it means is that when a criminal wants to launder money, and use the legal sector to do that, there is a high risk that they will try and do it through property because they can move a lot of money in one go. Um, they can move a lot of cash and turn it into a different sort of asset through a property transaction. So it's quite attractive um, for them to do that. I'll come back to risk in a little minute. Um, but if you are a practice that has a considerable conveyancing um, uh, exposure, then you will be higher up on the risk rating than somebody who says does, you know, employment law or something like that, because you're doing that kind of regulated activity. Um, the, the selection of firms is opaque, you know, they don't tell us who they're going to go and see. Um, but from my experience, they generally look at firms um, that have got quite a high profile, either um, conveyancing um, exposure or trust and company service provision. So they're, they're doing a lot of um, either creation of trust, high net worth individuals, those kinds of things, um, or company creation and company management work. Um, these are the high risk activities referenced in the National Risk Assessment. Outside of that, they're also interested in firms that are uh, of a size, really. So the bigger you are, the more likely you are to um, hit their radar. Um, because if you think about it, the money laundering reporting officer, money laundering compliance officer might be quite far away from the action in a larger firm. So they do want to make sure that your processes and procedures are robust enough in, in detecting money laundering. There is also this big um, focus when it comes to the legal sector, uh, this question mark over whether we are reporting enough. So whenever you think about what the regulator is interested in, when they're looking to test whether there's effectiveness in your, um, in your policies, controls and procedures, one of the measures of that is do you actually spot any criminal activity? Um, again, we'll come back to that as a theme um, during um, this morning's presentation. But when I talk about effectiveness, it's very difficult, really, to, to say whether your policies, controls and procedures are effective um, because, you know, criminals aren't going to say, oh, right, well, I was going to instruct you, but now I know you've got such tough policies, I'm not going to bother. You know, you haven't got a list of those people. So, you know, it's quite difficult to actually assess the effectiveness. But there are some things, some key metrics that hopefully we'll cover, well, we will cover them this morning that you can use to be able to demonstrate to yourselves and to your regulators that you think what you're doing is working. Now, out of the 74 firms they saw, you can see that 47 of them needed to have further contact. So we're almost at six, well, I think we're over 60% of the firms that were seen had to have um, some uh, a further engagement, the regulator, to prove that they'd sorted some things out. So that is a huge statistic that 60% of firms needed to do something extra. 60% of firms visited by the regulator were not where they should be. And I think, um, in all honesty, that does reflect my own personal experience. Um, Anti-money laundering, you know, it's, it's an in-depth area. It is something that took me personally two years to feel I had my head around completely and that was doing it all day every day and um, when I was back in practice um, and so you know I, it's not a surprise to me that the, the if you are looking closely with a magnifying glass at someone's policy controls and procedures you would you would pick up some things but I'll talk to you today about some of the kind of own goals the really easy things that you can um, look out for and remediate um, that we see all of the time um, that uh, that firms um, should be able to avoid being picked up on. Um, their concerns uh, were specifically around policies, controls and procedures. 
um, whether the, those policies, controls and procedures were effective, were fully updated, followed the law properly, um, whether they actually made sense. I mean, one key thing, hopefully I'll give you lots of key things to jot down today, but one key thing I would say is um, do ask somebody with a fresh pair of eyes to look at your policies, controls and procedures and see if they make sense. When we come in um, when we're invited in by firms to look at their policy controls, controls and procedures, it's very, very often the case that I will spot something that just doesn't make sense because I'm looking at it with a fresh pair of eyes, seeing if I can work out what the firm should be doing here for their AML. Um, so it's a good thing to do with a new starter who doesn't already know what your policies, controls and procedures are, but maybe just ask a colleague, imagine you didn't know what we do here for AML, could you figure that out from the policies, controls and procedures? Because the regulator, that's how they're looking at it. Can we work out what's going on here from this? If they have to look somewhere else like your, your website to work out the types of work that you do and the risk profile of your clients, then it's probably your, your policies, controls and procedures not comprehensive enough. Um, part of these visits that they're doing, they are picking up files and a lot of the issues that they saw were where the policies, controls and procedures said one thing and the file said something else. And again, very common for me to see that in practice. Um, I mean, and that would be anything, you know, <laughs> it doesn't just mean um, that happens in an AML. You look at any compliance at all, there'll be a set of policies, controls and procedures. And when you pick up a file, you might not see something that, you know, properly mirrors that. Um, so. Um, just be aware that should you have a visit from the regulator, they will be looking to compare um, what is actually happening in practice. And it goes to one of the things that I say very, very often to people, please don't have policies, controls and procedures that say that people should be doing things when you know very well that they're not. Um, either you need to get them all doing what they should be doing in the policies, controls and procedures or change the policies, controls and procedures to reflect what's actually happening in practice. Please don't have a disconnect between them because it's so easy to spot. Um, and then lastly, um, they had some issues about reviewing um, client due diligence and whether that was done um, regularly or not. So I'll talk about that in, um, shortly when we look at ongoing monitoring. So um, 12 firms um, were written to out of the 74 with guidance and nine of the firms were referred for um, investigation. They may or may not be disciplined. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but there is obviously a chance that they will be. And you can see that the consequences um, for AML non-compliance um, are um, quite hefty in some cases. Um, even firms that have, you know, not done anything that constitutes money laundering in of itself can find themselves having quite heavy fines um, levied against them. So it is something to be aware of um, and that the key message really is that if the, regular, the regulator sees an AML um, deficiency, they are likely to pursue something. They are saying that they're doing more what's called compliance plans. So um, where they write to you and say, you've got to do X, Y, and Z within eight weeks or something like that, rather than disciplining firms. But if they see something that causes, you know, that hits one of the other principles, you know, failing to uphold the trust of public places in um, the provision of legal services, those kind of SRA principles, if they see anything that's like that, systemic failures around compliance with people, people ignoring the policies and procedures, they are likely to pursue disciplinary in those cases. Um, so um, you should expect if there are fa failings, um, I don't want to scare you all, but you know some of the things that they've um, taken, you know, taken forward to disciplinary are little tiny things. You know, no money laundering happened, but they, they pursued them uh, nevertheless. So getting onto the the nitty gritty of what I promised to talk about is um, due diligence. Now, just before I get into this, if you learn nothing else from me today, please learn this. When we talk about client due diligence, it's actually an activity of four or five parts, depending on the type of client you've got. Most people in the legal industry assume that client due diligence is ID and V, identification and verification. And that is only part of the story. So when the regulator finds that there are issues around client due diligence, they're really finding that there are issues around the application fully of the CDD requirements within the regulations. Um, lots of firms have got solutions for identification and verification of people. But as I said to you earlier on, 
Um, identifying and verifying that somebody lives at a certain place and has a picture that looks like this does not prevent money laundering because baddies live somewhere, don't they? Um, so the only way you prevent money laundering really is making sure you're not moving dirty money. Um, so just keep that in the back of your mind when you think about the effectiveness of your CDD processes. This is not just about how, do we know which door to knock on? I mean, that is the purpose of doing that. And when we look at electronic verification, I know Louise is going to take you through um, Infotrack Solution. Really, the name of the game there is to get that process working as slick as slickly, as if, if that, that's even a word, <laughs> um, to have it as sleek as possible. There we go. Um, to, to make sure that people are not spending a lot of time and activity on that unnecessarily when they need to be really thinking about um, other issues. Those other issues being specifically um, the risk assessment for the matter and um, the purpose and nature of the business relationship. So just taking these things uh, one at a time very quickly, in order to comply with the money laundering regulations where you do um, a, a matter for a client that falls within the money laundering regulation definition, so normally a transaction, you need to do these things. First of all, in order to comply with 20, regulation 28, um, you need to conduct a matter risk assessment. Now, there's nothing in the regulation that says that should be written down, but the regulators expect to see it written down. They work on the rule of thumb. If it's not written down, I don't think you've done it. So you need to make sure people in the discipline of having a matter risk assessment. Now, there are some firms that have a client risk assessment the first time they meet a client um, and haven't necessarily added on a, a matter for a risk assessment for subsequent matters. If you haven't got that, you probably do need to think about it. It doesn't have to be a massive form for the subsequent matters um, or at all. It never has to be a massive form, actually, but there has to be some sort of note to show that the fear specifically has thought about the risk assessment, um, uh, the risk attached to the particular matter, um, a uh, particularly if that has changed. So if you've been doing something for a client that's been low risk, has it been transactional in nature, and suddenly they become a transactional client and say they've come over from, I don't know, family law, um, they, you acted for them in family law and now you're buying them a house post-divorce. Now they're in transactional departments. You do need, it's a different risk. Um, in, the client risk might be the same, might be the same person. You might be still happy that you know where who they are, where the money comes from. But um, because we know that uh, property transactions are deemed as high risk, as I said to you before, you're going to definitely need to think about does this, the fact that this person is now instructing us for a high risk matter change our overall risk assessment for that person. And this should be written down. Now, if you look at the Legal Sector Affinity Group guidance, um, which was is still in draft form, as far as I know, uh, was published uh, back in March, you will see in there that the regulator's expectation is that the matter risk assessment dictates the amount of client due diligence that you're going to do. Um, so if you have a low risk risk assessment, you might do one type of client due diligence. Or if you had a high risk risk assessment, you would do more client due diligence um, probably would be the expectation. Um, and so, you know, this matter risk assessment, they may expect to say at the bottom, and therefore, I'm going to do the standard due diligence on the enhanced due diligence or simplified due diligence, something like that. Now, it is open to you not to do that if your process doesn't necessarily result in a and do this level of due diligence. That that can be OK. But if you are ever going to do anything that is kind of contrary to what's suggested in the legal sector affinity group guidance, it's important that you. Uh, make a note as to why you think this. So what I find very often in practice, especially in smaller practices, is that they have a very standard but thorough way of doing client ID and verification of individuals. And that never changes based on, on who they are or the risks for the actual matter. Um, so, you know, checking out, um, you know, how many passes you need on the electronic verification or if you are getting additional documentation from a client you know the the number of documents that you're getting from a client is the same every time if that's done to a very high and robust level that would be suitable for an enhanced due diligence client I think you need to say in your policies controls and procedures that you have this enhanced level for all clients 
Um, if you do have different levels, so for certain types of clients, certain types of situations, you'll do less client due diligence. I think you need to make sure you've recorded um, in your policies, controls and procedures, the circumstances in which you could use either or process. So um, hopefully that's uh, ringing some bells with you if you haven't already done that in your policies, controls and procedures. So you've got to conduct a, risk, a matter risk assessment. You've got to do ID and V where your client is not a person, so not a human being. Um, so there's some sort of entity, whether that's a limited company or a partnership or a trust or something like that. You've got to understand who the beneficial owner is. Now, a beneficial owner is a person with the power uh, behind um, the entity, who, who makes the decision, who's calling the shots, really. Um, and you've got to think about how to, to uh, find them um and um who they are first of all and then how you verify them now verification of a beneficial owner if you do look at the legal sector affinity group guidance could be slightly different and um, depending on um the uh the entity where they are whether they're a higher risk entity or a lower risk entity some firms will still pursue say passports of driving license or electronic verification proof that a beneficial owner exists not all firms do, and that is open to you to decide on what you think the right process is for your firm, um, but make sure you are doing it. Number four, obtain information on the purpose and the intended nature of the business relationship. This really is where Source of Funds, Source of Wealth sits, and I'm going to talk to you about that um, shortly. Um, the, the obligation isn't just about Source of Funds, Source of Wealth. Um, but as I said before, how do you stop money laundering? You make sure you're not moving dirty money. So that's really what this one, how this is relevant to us. Um, and the last one is carrying out ongoing monitoring. Now, I did mention to you that one of the things the SRA were concerned about was people renewing their client due diligence, whether they're doing it frequently enough or not. That comes into ongoing monitoring. So there is an obligation in the regulations that where you have long-standing clients to, from time to time, review your client due diligence and make sure it's still current if it's within the same matter. What I normally say to firms is get into the practice of checking the existing client due diligence you've got every time you open a new matter, check that nothing's changed. They haven't moved house, they've not changed the name, the um, ownership of the company hasn't changed, these kinds of things. Um, and as I say, the regulator are a bit concerned that some people's processes don't necessarily have that discipline to it that there will be um, checking them regularly. A fairly common thing that I see when I'm out and about is for firms to re-screen clients on a periodic basis. So they might act for a client, and then if there's a gap, um, uh, or the you know there's there's a three year gap or something between the first time they acted for them and the latest instruction, they might um, re-screen the client. As I say, um, there's lots of different ways to skin that cat of ongoing monitoring, but making sure that you can demonstrate in your policies and procedures that um, you don't just do the client due diligence once when they come through the door and you never do it again. That's really what you need to be guarding against. So on to the findings that we can see um, from that report that I've referenced. Um, and I have already kind of tipped you off to these things already. 29% of the files that they looked at didn't have a written matter risk assessment. So as I've said to you, the regulation doesn't say you have to have a written risk assessment, but if it's not written down, they're going to assume you haven't done it. So make sure that people, you firstly have a process and secondly, people are doing it. Um, again, this probably reflects my own experience um, that um, some firms do have a risk assessment process that you can't pass go without doing. Um, but sometimes I find that they're just ticked um, kind of almost blindly, you know, just people aren't really engaging with the process. I can't understand from the risk assessment what they've actually thought about from risk. They've just ticked a few boxes. Um, so always um, be mindful of that. There are, if you um, haven't already seen it in the Legal Sector Affinity Group guidance, half of the chapter about risk assessment is about matter risk assessments. Um, so there's a lot of detail in there. If you're wondering about whether your risk assessment process is adequate or not, you can definitely go and have a look in there and see what they say. They're concerned that there's no conclusion following the risk assessment. I already said to you, the expectation is that there would be a conclusion of um, either uh, standard or enhanced or low, medium or high risk, something like that. And a lot of firms that have been deploying a standard, a, a kind of routine due diligence process haven't necessarily got into the discipline of saying whether something's low, medium or high or standard or, or enhanced due diligence, uh, sorry, standard or enhanced risk. 
So if you haven't got an ultimate risk assessment at the bottom of your matter risk assessments, have a look at that. They identified conflicts with the firm's risk assessment. This is why I flagged up to you about property. Your firm risk assessment probably should say that your property departments are potentially high risk because that's what's in the national risk assessment. That's what's in the supervisor's risk assessment. And what they're saying is that when they're looking at the matter risk assessments, where a firm's risk assessment says that particular work type is high risk, they then go and look at the matter ones for those particular files that are in that department and they are saying low risk um, and there's a disconnect that again is something that I pick up quite often um, and then some assumptions that the IDMV system had something to do with the matter risk assessment now in some firms their their um, electronic systems that they've put in to help them manage client um, due diligence does include a matter risk assessment um, but if a lawyer doesn't think that they themselves have been asked to think about the risk and assuming that something else is doing it or someone else is doing it, like a centralised team, they're probably going to come unstuck. So their expectations are that the, um, your fee earners, your lawyers, um, understand that they need to do the, the risk assessment. And part of complying with regulation um, 2812A2, in case you wanted to know which one it was, um, says that the matter risk assessment must take into account the firm's risk assessment. So there shouldn't be a disconnect between the firm's risk assessment and the matter one. Okay. Um, findings on client due diligence. 53% of the cases that they looked at had insufficient client due diligence on the file. Um, they commented that only 8% of firms are using reliance, which is relying on somebody else's client due diligence. I'm not surprised about that at all, actually. I don't think many people in the legal sector do use it, really. 11% um, of um, firms relied on clients answering a question, are you a politically exposed person or not, rather than using um, external forces to check, you know, so electronic verification to check. Great news, 91% of firms had been able to report that they turned away a client because of AML concerns. We talked at the very beginning about effectiveness. Are you effective in your AML policies, controls and procedures? And I said to you that there's a very big question mark over whether we're reporting enough to the police and they're using that as an assessment of whether we're effective. And I said to you, there's different ways of proving if you're effective. One of them is this. If you don't already keep a list of how many files do you turn away because of AML um, concerns, please start keeping a list of those. It's a really great way of showing that your training has worked, your risk assessment process works. Um, you know, if 100% of matter risk assessments always got through, I'd be asking whether the, the lawyers were actually identifying the right risks. Um, if you never had any internal conversations with people about uh, do you think this is okay no one ever knocks on your door then I'd be asking whether your training is actually working whether people actually understand what they're supposed to be looking out for um it could be that you know you're super low risk but I'm talking to people who do conveyancing activity here with source of funds source of wealth con concerns so I'd be very surprised if you didn't have some so three numbers you should definitely make sure if you're the MLRO or MLCO that you know firstly how many SARS you do do to the police uh, first of all, that's kind of obvious. Second, how many cases come to you where people ask you about the CDD, they're not sure, what other questions should we ask, should we carry on and act, where you do subsequently decide that you can act? And number three, how many jobs do you decide not to do because either you can't get decent answers to your CDD questions or you're just not happy with it? Those three numbers will give you a much better picture of your effectiveness of your program rather than just how many you reported to the police, which is just one of those numbers. 15 cases um, uh, ha didn't have enhanced due diligence conducted when they should have done because of risk factors that were identified in the case. Um, and there were 20 cases where a proper assessment of the level of CDD could not be made. So the, the, there was no, um, there wasn't a proper risk assessment that confirmed what the client due diligence should be. There wasn't enough information when they looked at the file. And again, that is something that I see in practice all the time. When we come and audit, one of the questions that my auditors are looking for is, do we agree with the risk assessment that was made and the CDD that was carried out? If there isn't enough information on the file about the risks from a particular matter, enough instructions essentially captured on the file, 
as an auditor or as a regulator, it's very difficult for me to work out whether you did the right CDD or not. Um, and as I said, this isn't really about um, doing things for the regulator's point of view, um, but for us to be able to test that people are following the policies and procedures properly, this is the kind of logic we have to deploy. Can I follow their logic? Does it make sense what they did? Um, and certainly, as nearly everybody that's on today, I'm guessing, will have to have an audit or sh will be expected to have had an audit, um, then um, you've got to take into account what will the auditor be able to see. So the expectations of the regulators are that fianas must be able to assess and understand the CDD information, even where it's compiled with a, a client uh, by a central team. That's because, you know, a lot of this, the cases that they looked at, there was a central team um, and there were gaps in the CDD, as we've seen, 53 percent. And the um, lawyers assumed that somebody else was doing that job for them. This client due diligence is something that the person who's doing the job has to be involved in. You can't outsource that to a central team. Definitely outsource the gathering of the information, the um, running the CDD searches electronically to someone else, but the lawyer has got to bring all that information together in their head and really ask themselves this. Does what um, I've been given in terms of evidence here from the electronic check or anything the client sent in, does this match what I thought was the case? Does this match what they told me? Does this make sense? Does it have any hallmarks of, of anything that I think is criminal activity? You can't, because the lawyer is the only person talking to the client, you can't outsource that to a secretary or someone else to make a decision about. It's got They've got to be involved in it. The regulator would prefer to see a combination approach to PEP. So even if you are asking the client, are you a politically exposed person, they would prefer that you use an electronic verification check to confirm that, whatever you're being told. Um, that firms should have risk-based policies. And um, they say that um, they've got a bit of a bugbear. There are some firms that just say, we don't act for PEPs. And if somebody is a PEP, we just turn them away. And they say, that's not a good idea. Actually, I disagree with the regulator about this. If you think that you do not have the expertise to understand the risk from a politically exposed person, and you decide that we'll be, We'll, we'll, we'll manage without the odd PEP coming in. We've got enough other clients to worry about. Um, and you decide not to onboard PEPs because you're unfamiliar with the risks, then I think that's an entirely appropriate thing for you to do. Um, either understand the risks or don't do the work. I mean, and that would go for something like cryptocurrency. I don't want to open a hornet's nest on the Q&A and what, <laughs> get you to ask me about cryptocurrency. Well, the same logic um, applies. If you can't understand how cryptocurrency works and how a client might have deposit funds out of cryptocurrency, probably don't do the jobs that have got cryptocurrency in them um, because you're opening yourself up to risks that you can't, you don't understand. Where you do have politically exposed persons, if you do go ahead and you do decide that you will act for politically exposed persons, one of the things that we see an awful lot is that the record keeping in relation to the ongoing monitoring that you are required to do is scant. We can't see it. If you identify politically exposed people, you've got to do several things before you can proceed to act. First of all, you've got to do enhanced due diligence. Second of all, you need senior management approval to act for that person. That's actually someone somewhere has to be said, yes, we will onboard um, such and such who is a politically exposed person. Um, and then there has to be ongoing monitoring. So really, as, a, as an auditor or the regulator, I'm going to ask you, can I see your list of uh, politically exposed people, please? And can you show me what ongoing monitoring you've done with them? So if you haven't got a list, and you haven't done any ongoing monitoring, then you are going to struggle. So make sure that you have got that process. And then turning on to uh, what I think is the most important bit of client due diligence, if I'm honest, which is the source of funds, source of wealth. This is going to be the biggest theme, the biggest thing that you're going to have to get your head around as we come into 2022 and onwards. Um, for the last kind of two or three years, the regulator's been really focused on have you got adequate risk assessment? Have you got policies, controls and procedures? So that's where their focus has been. You know, you've had those thematic reviews where you've had to send your risk assessments in. You've had the, you've had some other desk based things where they want to see your policies and procedures. They're doing these things, knocking on the door and having a look at what your policies, procedures are. And is that what's happening in practice? The more and more the regulator do that, the more and more they notice that the source of funds, source of wealth activity is not done very well often. Um, it might, in fact, I'm, I'll, I'll take that back. It might be done really, really well, but they can't see it on the file. 
So here's the thing. When I'm out and about and I'm talking to people about source of funds, source of wealth, and I perhaps talk to a private client lawyer who's doing setting up a trust to manage someone's estate so that they're not um, so they're managing their risk for inheritance tax, or I'm talking to a company that is about to acquire another company um, and is doing so out of its assets or is restructuring, something like that. The lawyers know loads about those clients source of funds source of wealth because they wouldn't be able to give them the legal advice without knowing that um except it's next to never written down on the file there's no proof of it um and even the considerations about it are not written down on the file back to if it's not written down i don't think you've done it now when you look at this document that i've given you the link to you will see that the regulator is taking a very keen interest in this and taking what I think is a very narrow interpretation of the regulations in terms of what they think it means. They think that, I suppose it could, you might say widely, but they're saying that they think that the obligation to carry out a risk assessment in regulation 2812A2, which we just talked about before, the matter risk assessment, must include understanding and evidencing the source of funds we consider that carrying out and evidencing a source of funds check is crucial to comply with the obligation to carry out a matter risk assessment is what they think so folks if you're doing property work conveyance in particularly it's quite common for me to see something that says like six months bank statements um or wherever the money has been in, you know, including third parties. And, and that's generally the advice I give to people if they ask me, what should we do about source funds and residential conveyance and Amy? And I'm like, see some bank statements going back a little while. The reason you want to go back a little while is because you want to think whether the p way the person's been accumulating these funds makes sense or whether it's got the hallmarks of criminal activity. One bank statement's not going to get you there. A few sh showing their savings accumulate or money coming in from selling shares or whatever will give you some comfort that what they've told you is actually the truth um when it comes to other departments that you might be also interested in um that can be a bit trickier you know corporates and things like that commercial property deals things like that um you know are you really going to ask richard branson for a bank statement is that really going to take you anywhere so in other departments you might want to have different approaches based on the risk and this is why i said at the very beginning today about your matter risk assessment and whether that dictates the amount of client due diligence you do do your policies controls and procedures um, allow for people to take different um, um, approaches to source of funds, source of wealth, depending on the risk. If not, it's something you might want to think about because it is going to be certainly the case that wherever you're doing a transaction, the regulator is going to ask you about what you thought you should do for source of funds and source of wealth and what proof there is that that actually happened. Um, so, um, have a think about that. As I say, I'm sure I'll be um, we'll be doing other webinars in the future about solely about source of funds, source of wealth, um, because I just think it's such a, um, a tricky thing to be able to build a policy for. Um, it's easier, I think, where you can get a blanket. We want to see bank statements for six months. But that doesn't work for all work types. Um, and so I think you do need to think about how to how to evidence that across the practice. Um, but certainly, um, not being um not not focusing on it not covering it in your policies controls and procedures will um raise the eyebrow of any regulator um, and they will look at the file and see if it's there i'll leave you with uh, one question that is uh, one that i always ask the lawyers and it's something that you might want to consider when um, you're looking at your policies controls and procedures um, in this space what i say to the lawyers is this if I pick up your file tomorrow to consider, to look at whether you've understood the, um, the risk um, from the source of funds, source of wealth, and whether you've conducted ongoing monitoring, will I be able to see anything on your file? The answer is pretty often, no, you won't be able to see anything on my file. If that is the case for you guys, that you, your lawyers have done you know, the onboarding, they've done a risk assessment at the beginning, they've got the ID on the file, they've got the search result from the InfoTrack system on the file, but then there's nothing about the source of funds, source of wealth, or nothing about considering whether that's still the same before they complete the transaction. 
I would look at that urgently um, because, as I say, if it's not written down, they're going to think you've not done it. So um, that's it from me. Lovely. Thanks, Amy. That was fantastic. Um, and I'm hoping that everyone's been able to take something away from that session. And don't forget to pop any questions you might have into the Q&A box and we'll pick these up at the end. I'm now going to hand you over to Louise, who's going to run through the AML service through InfoTrack. Thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Amy. Let me just share my screen. So really excited to show you our AML product um, that we've basically built to provide an improved way to submit, monitor and manage the firm's AML searches. So our enhanced ordering screen, which is just based across the InfoTrack home screen, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, allows for additional search features when actually submitting your AML. So by doing it through the system, it allows you to input additional information such as alias name and residency. So this provides a much more thorough result as you're able to input more information. The product also caters for company AML and international as well. So we've got the company tab across the top, obviously requesting some company information in there. And one of the benefits of this sort of recent version of the system is that international searches are now based off of the country of residency. So this takes out the manual intervention to determine the type and mitigating inconsistencies and risks within the firm. So I would come in as a user, select nationality and current address from the drop down here. And it's this current address that will base, um, that will base the search essentially either in the UK or an international search there. One of the things that we've built recently that's quite a useful tool for any InfoTrack users is demonstration mode. So this will basically populate for me an example matter with two individuals in here. So you can see that I've got Miss Harriet Bentley, nationality, date of birth and address information in there and gone in and selected the relationship, interview type, risk assessment and the search type as well for both parties. So it will then request me to enter in the ID and address documentation in here, along with expiry information and upload the details if I need to. Once I've confirmed that I've informed the subject of the AML search, I can then go ahead and click order. Instant results are then returned and will be sent out to you via email and pushed back down into your case via case, uh, your case within case management system if you access our InfoTrack platform via integration. This is where the ongoing monitoring aspect comes in as well. So if any clients do appear at a later date on any PEPs and sanctions list, or the documents expire, you'll get alerted to the change through InfoTrack system. So it's not enough, obviously, or it's not just that the initial search will get returned as soon as you place order. We'll also continue to monitor that client for a year after you've placed the order. And we'll also, we've also built in archive results. So if you are no longer proceeding with that client, you can archive the results to basically turn off the alerts. If any of your searches are returned as non-compliant, like you can see here, the document has come back with non-compliant information. Going through the summary of the firm will obviously call out the results of the risk assessment result, the enhanced electronic result, and sort of the PEPs and sanctions list up here before confirming client data, documentation, and the granular details sort of down at the bottom. But if any of your results do come back as non-compliant, We've built the update service into the tab just to the right here. So this basically allows you to confirm that you've satisfied certain additional checks and issue a compliant result. So I would come in and say that I'm happy um, basically mitigating the risk of like what's come back from the initial alert, add in any supporting messages and documents, hit submit, and then this will issue a compliant result for this party. All of the results, um, so the initial result, the updates, any alert and any updated documents will go into all related files. So you've just got one handy place to store all related documents. Finally, we've built a dashboard to assist with managing all of the work. So you can come in, anyone at the team can come in at any given time and just have oversight over compliant and non-compliant results maybe going through and looking into additional information as to why results have come back non-compliant and if there are any further steps which need taking there. So thank you for dialing in. That's our full solution for submitting, monitoring and managing all AML searches for the firm. I'll hand back to Lucy for the Q&A section. 
Lovely. Thank you, Louise. Um, I can see that we've had um, some questions come through already, so we'll get straight into it. Um, Amy, a question for you. Do you have a template form for conducting a matter risk assessment that we can implement? Um, well, I do, obviously, <laughs> for my clients, but I can tell you where you can get one for free. And you're very welcome to contact me and, um, <laughs> and buy one from me if you like. But if you have a look on the Law Society of Scotland website, you will see that they have something called uh, an AML toolkit. And they have a matter risk assessment there, which is practically identical to the one that I do. I will just say I didn't steal it from them. I did mine first. Um, but um, essentially what they've got there is a three box um, form that encourages the lawyers to do a narrative risk assessment rather than ticking boxes um, at each stage. So um, what I call the barge pole test. So do I want to touch this job with a barge pole or not? There's one box for that. Then there's a box for after you've looked at the source of funds, source of wealth, what are my observations about risk here? Um, and am I happy to proceed? And then just before you do the thing that could be money laundering, so that would be um, just before you uh, complete a transaction in a conveyancing um, matter, you would revisit the risk assessment and just confirm that you're still happy to proceed. Um, so, yeah, on the Law Society Scotland one, you can get a free um, uh, template from them. Lovely, thank you. Um, we've had a question through Louise. Um, with InfoTrack AML, if it's non-compliant, then what further information do you expect us to then provide to make it compliant? Um, I guess this would really come down to the practices that the firm would have in place. We don't really tend to advise on what additional checks would be required. We do give information in there as to why the result has come back non-compliant in the first place. So obviously the key area that would need to be reviewed. What the update service really provides is just a consistent way for team members to come in and make sure that all of their AML searches are up to date and compliant, essentially. So we just give you the facility for everyone to come in via one channel to raise um, or add in additional notes, basically, to issue a compliant result. Um, if I can jump in on that one, Louise, I completely understand because it's very difficult to give a... a um... Of um, a one size fits all answer to that yeah. question because it, it depends, doesn't it? I suppose commonly from being a person who's used these kinds of systems and run a CDD team, the what rule of thumb I would give you is is from the information that you're given by the provider as to what is missing, think about what the significance of that is. So, for example, um, if you're it's not compliant because um, you can't find proof of date of birth, then you're going to be thinking about how do I otherwise provide get proof of date of birth from um somebody else like um uh um a passport driving license that kind of thing if it's um if it's uh, address id often you know when people have just moved or things like that or if they um are very wealthy sometimes you struggle to find them on these systems because you don't have the same credit footprint um so it, it really does depend on what as um, louise says what the results say but my, what i would say to you is what is it saying to me i haven't got proof of what can't i prove as a result of this and then that will usually lead you to figure out what else you need Lovely, thank you. Um, Amy, we've had a couple of questions about people asking, um, can we instruct you to carry out a compliance visit just to see um, the things we are doing right? Yeah, so, oh, thank you. That's lovely. It ne ne never happens that anyone asks me outright on the session. You're very welcome to contact me. Um, uh, um, I'm on, um, it's amy at tealcompliance.com. Um, or you can find me on LinkedIn is usually the easiest way to find me, Amy Bell on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, I have a teal background, so you'll know it's me. Um, what we, we do a couple of things. So um, we obviously I've mentioned we do auditing. Um, what I would say to a firm is if you're not sure that you have got everything that you should have, um, and you're kind of a bit nervous about going in for an audit because you think you might have some gaps, then we do have a separate service called an AML review service, which is um, where we will look at your policies, controls and procedures, like I said, with a fresh pair of eyes, check that you've got everything in there that you should have to comply with the law and give you a to-do list if you haven't. So we'll often, at the end of that process, you get a list of, you haven't got this, this won't work, you've got this, but it might not work. Um, that that's um 
usually um, £1,300 plus VAT. Um, and um, then if we do come back and do an audit later on, we'll, uh, you'll at least know that your policies, controls and procedures have got everything that the law needs. I'd usually advise a good six months between an AML review and a full audit, because if you need to do any changes, you want to get them changed and you want them to follow through and be visible on the files by the time you take you do the audit. Um, so if you if you think that the um, you've got um, a uh, you're just not sure that you've got everything that the law wants covered properly, then go for the AML review first. Um, uh, if you think you're ship shape and you think actually, Amy, I think we've got everything we need, um, but I do need an audit. We do do that as well. Lovely, thank you. We've also had a question for Amy. Um, I'd be interested in your views on how to handle AML in relation to acting for the buyer in a small company purchase where the seller is supported up to, but not for completion, by an unregulated legal services provider. Oh, interesting. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because we often, and it, I mean, it's, you, it, you could ask me a similar question about a person, you know, who's, who's unrepresented, um, because we always take this comfort, don't we, from the other side being regulated, so they must be doing their checks. Um, it's actually a really long answer, <laughs> which we probably haven't got time to go into in too much depth. You ve feel very free to message me um, or um, contact me by email um, on amy at tailcomelights.com. But the quick answer is this. If you're buying and the thing you're buying is dirty money, if you have no idea about that, then you are not going to commit an offence by buying something that was funded by the proceeds of crime. Um, if you do start looking into it and you do discover that you think that there's something concerning about the asset that you're buying, and when I say asset, that could be a company, it could be a property. Um, if you start digging around and you become uncomfortable, you then expose yourself and your client to the risk of committing a, an offence under the Proceeds of Crime Act where you might need a defence to go forward. So when you are required to do client due diligence, just be aware of this. ID and V is required on your client. Understanding the purpose and nature of the business relationship is really understanding what your client is trying to do in this situation, not about understanding about the other side and what they're trying to do. There's no obligation that puts that on you to look at the other side. And further, if you do start rooting around the other side, you might end up with answers to questions you really didn't want that start to compromise your client and the deal itself. So, I mean, that's something that I cover on my masterclass um, in, in quite some depth, um, but that's the quick answer. Do feel free to, to um, get in touch if you want a bit more detail on that answer. Thanks, Amy. We've had another question come through. Um, for the 91% who had turned mm. clients away because of AML concern, would you expect to see a correlating SAR for each client who was turned away? I'm going to give you the standard compliance consultant answer here, <laughs> which is it depends. Um, it does really depend. I'll tell you what it depends on, though. Um, it depends on the level of suspicion you've got. So here's the thing. I said to you before, didn't I, about if you've got a client who's who's going to buy. Um, I had one last week. One rang me up. Actually, someone rang me up last week and asked me about one, um, which was they have got uh, it's a banking question they've basically got someone who's trying to open a bank account and the money they're going to be putting into the bank account was money that they got as a result of selling cryptocurrency that they were given to pay them for a piece of work that they did so they did a piece of work they were paid in cryptocurrency they've now sold that converted it into sterling and they want to open a new bank account with it so this would be the similar to you being asked to use that money as a house deposit um so i'm sure you can see the the kind of relevance there and I said to them, well, listen, do you understand how to read a cryptocurrency wallet? And they said, no, not really. I said, well, then you probably want to say, I don't want to do that and turn them away. And so that might fall into you, I've turned them away numbers, but you wouldn't have anything necessarily to say that you suspect that they've committed an offence and therefore you've got to do a report. So many firms turn things away because they're outside their risk appetite. They're not things that they're familiar enough with. There's gaps in the client due diligence. But 
they don't reach the threshold for reporting for POCA. These are two separate issues. Again, something that I cover on the masterclass in, in quite some depth, so I haven't really got the time to go into it in huge amount of depth here. But the rule of thumb is, if you are rejecting something because you are suspicious, where suspicion is that there is a possibility more than merely fanciful that there is criminal activity and that the assets that are being used are the proceeds of that criminal activity, then you have to do a SAR. If you don't reach the test for suspicion, then you might just turn the job away and you wouldn't necessarily do a SAR. So hopefully I've qualified my it depends there, Lucy. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you, Amy. And um, we've had another question come through. We already use InfoTrack for AML and we do conduct enhanced AML search on every onboarding client, regardless of matter type or the client risk. Do we still need evidence of a matter risk assessment? Um, Louise, in your <laughs> system, I think you've got risk in there, haven't you? Yeah, so we've got um, the risk assessment set up for the team to decide, obviously, on a case by case basis, what's the relevant answer there. That will then affect the availability of enhanced and simplified um, search types that you can submit through the system. And we've got a full breakdown of what the difference between a simplified and an enhanced report is on our FAQs within the website. But it basically means that with an enhanced, you get granular detail additionally coming back in the report and not just sort of the PEPs and sanctions check. Um, I'm not too sure about the evidence um, for the matter risk assessment, but we that's basically how it works in terms of the logic in the system and the full breakdown of enhanced versus simplified is available in the FAQs button within the info chat page. I think I would say to it, I'd say, and going back to what I've said in the presentation, which is you really want to look at it with a piece, with a with the fresh eyes that says, have we got captured on here why we think that it's this particular assessment of risk? Um, and the other thing I would say about it is the risk isn't just about what's the assessment of risk to dictate how much ID I should get. There's then this secondary issue of now I've got the source of funds, source of wealth. What do I think about risk? The reason those are two separate things, folks, is that you don't do them at the same time often. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you get all that information in one go and you can do both activities at the same time. The vast majority, especially in conveyancing transactions, you might ask a question about where the source of funds is coming from in your initial inquiry with a client, but you don't actually get proof of that until after you've sent the engagement letter, after you've sent the form that you want them to fill in about source of funds, source of wealth. So the time has passed for you to record that risk assessment on, on for example, the InfoTrack system, because it, you'll have done the search before, you, um, before you've got the information on which to make that secondary risk assessment. That's why I encourage this three box approach that I was talking about on the Scotland one, because um, it, it's, you've got to think about what is it that I'm recording the risk of. I'm recording a risk of the barge pole test do I want to act for this client? And if I do, what do I already know about this client that tells me how much ID I want to get about this person? Um, so that's the first test. The second one is I've asked, I've followed the firm's policy based on risk. I've asked for all this evidence about source of funds, source of wealth. I've asked for this information. Now, what do I think? Am I still happy that this is a case I'm happy to proceed with? Or do I think there's additional risk? So for example, if you did ask the first blush of questions, you got the first lot of information in, and there were still unanswered questions there, like there was some deposits of substantial amounts of money and you don't know why they're there, you're going to do an additional due diligence, aren't you? You're going to do enhanced source of funds, source of wealth due diligence. Um, and so you're going to write down, you know, there is some funds here. I'm not sure about where they are. I'm going to go back. I mean, in fact, you might not actually write that down, but you'll be evident from the file because you write to the client and you'll say, dear client, I looked at your bank statements and there's this sum of money. And can you please tell me what that um, means um, and give me some more evidence about it? So that'll be evident from the file. The point is what we want to see is that people aren't just switching their minds off after they've got passports, utility bills and they'll pass from the electronic check. We want to be able to show that they're considering risk or all the way through. Lovely. Thank you, Amy. Um, if the firm wide risk assessment says that a property is high, does that mean that all property matter risk assessments should be high? Um, not necessarily. I think you, when you are looking at your risk assessment, your matter risk assessment, it's going to be a composite of the risks in relation to that client and the risks in relation to the transaction. OK, so and I think this also breaks down depending on why the things 
you know being sold or or bought or whatever it, again i won't get on a soapbox right but if you are sell if your instruction is to sell a property for a client who you've done the you're appointed as executors for and you've done the will and you've acted for them for 30 years and you're very comfortable about them the transaction in itself is very low risk for money laundering because you're satisfied that the client's asset is not dirty that you're selling you know enough about this client to get to that situation so just because you're selling it doesn't from your point of view create a risk whereas the opposite you're having a client who you're buying for you don't really know much about them they're very evasive and it's very difficult to get the source of fund source of wealth they happen to have come from a high risk third country that's going to be a high risk client doing a high risk transaction so i think the output of your uh, matter risk assessment on a property matter the matter itself you've got to consider whether that's high risk and this is why when i say to firms about their firm risk assessment one of the things that i say to them is please take the time to break the work types down within a particular department because just saying that property full stop is high risk could actually not be the case i have a client who sells property for the nhs not high risk you know just because it happens to be a property transaction it's not high risk so um it's always worth the time and effort to kind of um separate out the different types of work that you do within a department um, to be able to give you a more accurate risk assessment, therefore help people later on when they're doing the matter risk assessments. Lovely. Thanks, Amy. Um, I am conscious of time. We have run over slightly. So what we'll do is we'll answer two more questions and then any questions that we aren't able to answer live, we will follow up directly afterwards. Um, so we've had another question come through. If the client is known to the firm, do I still need to carry out an InfoTrack AML? If not, what do I need to have on file to comply with the SRA? Um, shall I take that one, Louise? Um, because the LSAG has um, been really clear about that. So the LSAG I'm talking about is this Legal Sector Affinity Group guidance, guidance, right? So this is the guidance. You'll find it on all the um, Legal Sector Affinity Group's websites. It's on the Law Society website, the SRA website. It's the same document, okay? And um, one of the things that the SRA particular, particularly picked up was that they were coming across lots of firms that had what was called a long-standing client certificate on or a partner certificate. And that's because the Law Society, the Legal Sector Affinity Group guidance prior to this latest edition suggested that if the client was known to the firm that you could have a certificate signed by a partner um, that was proving their identity. Um, they have gone so far as to say in the latest LSAG and in SRA guidance that they do not consider that to comply with the regulations. So if you are still relying on these kind of partner certificates, just be warned that if the regulator saw them, they would consider that they're not compliant. What they're saying is that that's not independent verification. That's you just saying that they are who they say they are. It's not independent in any way. Um, and so um, they may ask you to do it now. So if you're just using those certificates and you've not got any ID on file at all, I think you should go and get some ID. As to whether you have to repeat the search every time the client comes back to you um, on the basis that you've done it once, you can set your intervals for that yourself. Um, I personally like to do it annually. But that's not in the law anywhere. I do know some sort of firms that review or renew those searches every three years for existing clients. Um, but given that the monitoring on the InfoTrack system um, ends, I think, Louise, after 12 months, then that might contribute to your decision about rescreening them. Lovely. Um, and then the last question, Amy, we've had a couple um, of questions themed around what level of training is required to be able to deal with this level of checking and compliance? What a good question that is. In the new Legal Sector Affinity Group guidance, you'll notice there's a new chapter about technology and the regulator is pretty concerned that people who are using technology, including like the InfoTrack system, um, don't understand what the results are. Here's the Here's the key things that I would make sure that are in your training program. First of all, your money laundering compliance officer should be able to explain to a regulator how any search provider searches that you are using work. They need to be able to explain why they think that that provider was appropriate for the firm um, and what it is that it's checking. The regulators are asking specifically questions about this because they've found that this is a big blind spot, especially if you're a new money laundering compliance officer and you've, you've inherited the system from someone else, put it in before you, um, make sure you know how to use it. Secondly, anyone who's using it 
should have a train have, have training on it, whether that's provided um, uh, by InfraTrack or other people within the department should be recorded that they've had training on how to use it. And that includes if there's any upgrades or changes, that there's a record kept of the training that they have. If lawyers are asked to interpret the results, then there sh that should be included in their training to explain what the results say and what they mean. And like that question we had just before and what should you do about it, that should be included in the training. It's a very, it's a key area as, as firms adopt more and more of this technology to um, help them manage their client due diligence. The regulators are concerned about people going, oh, well, the system's done it. It's not, you know, I'm just going to rely on the answer from the system without understanding how it works. And um, that is something you should definitely be making sure is included in the training. Lovely. Thanks, Amy. Um, just looking at the time, we will end the session here. If we haven't been able to answer your question, we will follow up with you directly afterwards. Um, and just to let you know, the I will be sharing a copy of the webinar with you as well, so you can refer back to Amy and Louise's notes at a later date. If you do have any other questions about anything that you've learned today or questions in relation to the AML offering through the InfoTrack platform, you can either email us directly or reach out to your dedicated account manager who will be able to assist you. I would just like to say as well a big thank you to Amy and Louise for their time today. Um, I hope you all found these sessions informative. All that's left to say is thank you so much for joining us today. Have a lovely rest of your day and a lovely rest of your week. Thank you.